30 million for a manuscript, 14 million for a book. Writing can be valuable, with rare editions sometimes fetching vast sums at auction. Unsurprising then that book thieves abound. Just last year in the UK, £2 million worth of antique books were stolen in a Mission Impossible style heist. 160 publications taken, so far no trace. Well, to find out a bit more about this world, we're joined on set now by book thief detective, if you like, Mr Ken Sanders. Mr Sanders, you've been responsible for bringing a number of book thieves to justice, you know, even a book about it, The Book Thief. Uh, tell us, uh, how does this all start? How does one be a book thief detective? Um, I belong to the American Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, which is a Every country has their own bookselling association like they do here in Paris. And we belong to it, the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers, ILAB. I know it's all boring, but that's how it starts. And they asked me, I went on our board of governors some 20 years ago, and they said, well, you have to, be, you have to do stuff. Okay, what do you want me to do? Well, there's an opening on the security committee. Okay, next thing I know, I'm in New York, I'm at these meetings, and... This is kind of in the beginning of the internet and email, and I'm a hopeless Luddite, but I figured out instead of getting written papers and mailing them out, it would be much faster to type an email, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how it began. Uh, but one wonders, because, you know, do you get reports of a, of a book heist and then they're coming to you to, to seek out the clues? Is it like a police detective only specialized in books? It, yeah, it takes a, an obsessive personality, but apparently I have that. There was a thief in the San Francisco Bay Area who was robbing our colleagues up and down the Bay Area and the California coast. Uh, it, I spent three years of my life figuring out who he was, how he was doing it, and setting up a sting operation to put him in, print, in prison. And how does one piece together these clues? Ones, they normally steal very rare books, so I guess that makes them more traceable, or...? Yeah, the higher profile a book, you're, you know, people are going to know about it. He would steal in the usually he was using stolen credit cards, and he was stealing books in the five to under ten thousand dollar range at a time. But over the years, it added up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. The hard thing about catching him was he was collecting them; he wasn't reselling them. Because that was going to be my next question. There's some of them are so high profile. Like last year in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, I believe works by Leonardo da Vinci. Like they were yes. really unique editions. You can't actually put them back on the market, surely. No, it's like a famous painting. They're, they're priceless historical cultural objects. That people and we just ha like we to have, have a horrible incident uh, in, in the United States right now with a bookseller and a librarian that are alleged to have stolen up to $8 million worth of rare materials, including Edward Sheriff Curtis's portraits of North American Indians. So from... it's really quite common. Is it as common then as other art? <sighs> I'd like to think not. Uh, it's a very tiny percentage of the market that where, where well, yeah, people don't. go bad. But I guess, yeah, it's the expense as well when they... But as well as being a book thief detective, of course, you only, all, also run uh, your own rare bookstore. We're seeing pictures of it behind us there. And, you know, you opened it, a, a publishing uh, division as well. Among your collection, I believe, you have a number of writings and, and drawings even by one author in particular, Everett Ross, who yes. disappeared, if you like, in a Christopher Candles kind of style, that Into the Wild book yes. that we all know from John Krakauer. Mm. Of course. Uh, but, but this is a writer that... Uh, Everett, Everett, Roos, fascinating. Everett Roos was a young man from Southern California who in the 1930s, during the era of the Great Depression, fell in love with Southern Utah and the Escalante Monument that uh, President Trump has been trying to destroy. Uh, in November of 1934, he wrote his brother Waldo a letter. As to when I shall revisit civilization, it will not be soon, I think. I have not yet tired of the wilderness. And he walked off into the red rock canyons of southern Utah, and he's still down there. I know, never to be seen, and there was a, a lot of false reports about his body. Yes. Um, but you have, a, firstly, when I think of the rare works, he, you know, did he write a lot? What, what remains of his works, and, and what do you have, and how did you come across them even? 
Well, that's what brings me here to, to Paris uh, with my friend and colleague Emmanuel Tellier tonight at the Mona Bismarck American Center. We're doing a presentation on Dorothea Lang, the famous farm home administration photographer of the Great Depression in the Southwest in the U.S. Uh, and, and she actually took a portrait of Everett Roos back, back before he disappeared. And so a traveling exhibition of, of her works are here. Emmanuel Tellier will be showing portions of his film on Everett Roos. And we will be discussing and talking about the American Southwest, Everett Roos, Dorothea Lang, her husband, Maynard Dixon, and other subjects of the Southwest. Over my career, I've handled original woodblock prints by Everett Roos, which are very, very rare. Also letters, drawings, poetry that he wrote. Uh, the University of Utah Special Collections back home in Salt Lake City, the Roos family donated 80 cartons of original Roos family materials to the library. I mean, because when we look at, at, at your bookshop, which is, uh, you know, has a pretty vast collection, um, how do you go about finding these rare editions? You know, is it down to donations by people putting them forward? or Usually we pay a pretty penny, That's I wish, but people do actually donate, you know, books almost every day because people cannot throw books away. I'm the rare, the rare ones, they find me. I don't even have to look anymore. I've done this a very long time. Yeah, now you're well known, so people kind of come to you. And, uh, you know, how can people know what is valuable when it comes to this antique uh, book trade? <clears throat> Rare and valuable is changing because of the digital age and the Internet. Books, you can buy them at a press of a button now. Mm. So a, a book to be truly rare means just because you can afford to buy it doesn't mean that you can find one. You have to wait until that object manifests itself in the market, even if you have five, six, seven figures available to spend on it. Absolutely. That's and, a rare book. And you've come across some rare, rare finds in, in your bookshop. Um, and just very briefly, before I let you go, but you mentioned there the documentary about Everett Roos. It is true that, you know, uh, art hikes in other, other kind of heists have been the stuff of Hollywood fiction for many a time. Hasn't happened when it came to literature. What, what kind of story are we likely to see in this? Is it another Into the Wild? There are parallels with Chris McCandless and Everett Roos, certainly, but young Everett was 20 years old when he disappeared. So the argument, was he a great artist? Was he a great poet? Was he a great storyteller? He was 20 years old. We'll never know. But in your opinion? In my opinion, yes, ma'am. Yes, <laughs> fantastic. Mr. Ken Sanders, thanks so much for coming in and giving us uh, your insight into your fascinating world. Ken Sanders there. Uh, book Thief Detective in Paris to talk more about Everett Roos at the Mona Bismarck American Centre this evening. Thanks so much. Merci.